Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for August 11th, 2017. On today's show, we'll be diving into the news, talking about a Neuromancer movie, Venom casting, more Hunger Games and Twilight films, how The Amazing Spider-Man 3 was supposed to end, and more details about Leia and DJ's roles in Star Wars The Last Jedi. In the mailbag, we're going to be talking about movies with, which Hollywood should reboot in our, in our feature presentation. I'm going to be talking to Hui Tran Bui. Uh, about why this summer is one of the best in decades and what Hollywood should learn from it. But right now with me, I have Ben Pearson. Hey, how's it going? And Brad Oman. That's me. Uh, let's dive into this. Uh, news that broke uh, over the night was that they are uh, that a Neuromancer movie is going to be directed by Deadpool Helmer Tim Miller. Ben, you wrote this up for SlashFilm.com. What do we know about it? Yeah, William Gibson's 1984 sci-fi novel Neuromancer is um, highly acclaimed and and well recognized for sort of predicting a lot of the technological advancements that we actually uh, are living with today. Um, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, virtual reality, stuff like that. He basically like invented the internet and coined the term cyberspace in fiction before those things became real. So Neuromancer is like a huge, important sci-fi movie or sci-fi book for a lot of people. And a movie version has been in the works for a long, long time. Uh, Tim Miller from Deadpool is the latest person to be attached to it. Uh, we know that Simon Kinberg is going to be producing it. He's the guy who wrote and produced a lot of the X-Men movies. So, yeah, the I mean, it's still very early on in the process, but this movie has been, you know, it's gone through directors like Joseph Kahn and uh, Vincenzo Natali before. I think Mark Wahlberg and Hayden Christensen were attached at various points to star in it. Obviously, those never happened, but... I know a lot of people are excited about a Neuromancer movie, and I think that uh, Miller's work uh, in visual effects with Blur Studios, the company that he this was like the creative director for before he directed Deadpool, uh, means that he's probably a pretty decent choice to take this movie on. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and Miller had a fallen out. He he's not directing Deadpool two, but he he's already signed up for a ton of movies, including James Cameron's Terminator. Uh, he's producing a Sonic the Hedgehog movie, uh, mm -hmm. this, and I think there was one other, I don't have it in, in front of me. So I, I'm just wondering when, when he's going to find the time for all of this, but this, this one sounds like the most promising, like uh, using his tool set. Especially. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, the amazing Spider-Man three will never come to fruition. Obviously Mark Webb's, uh, trilogy has never had an ending, um, but we're, we're, we're finally finding out some of the things that would have happened with it while Mark Webb is promoting his new movie, uh, The Only Living Boy in New York. He talked to Den of Geek. Uh, Jack Drew wrote the article on SlashFilm.com, and basically he told Den of Geek that Chris Cooper's character w was going to come back and play the Green Goblin. If you don't remember, Chris Cooper's character uh, was, uh, I believe, uh, Harry Osborn? Norman Osborn. Norman, sorry, Norman Osborn, uh, and uh, he died of an of an illness in, in the films, and they were gonna freeze his head, and they were gonna bring him back to life, and that character was gonna be called. Uh, then there was a character gonna be called the gentleman. Uh, they had some notions on how to do it, uh, says Mark Webb, but I think maybe they were thinking too far ahead when we started building in those things. Uh, but it was a fun exercise, he admits. He said that they also had plans for the Vulture. Um, the you know This is going to lead up to a Sinister Six movie that was announced and, again, will never happen. Uh, I, I think we dodged a bullet with this one, guys. Uh, th <laughs> yeah. th this just sounds like, I don't know. It sounds Freezing bad. his head? Seriously? Come on. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't... Um... You know, the only thing I do want to know is I want to know what was up with Peter Parker's parents. Someone needs to ask Mark Webb about that because that whole storyline does not make any sense. And we have no conclusion. And it keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> and another story that broke yet, uh, last night after we got off there was uh, Rogue One star Riz Ahmed is in talks for, a Ven uh, for the Venom movie. Uh, he might or might not be playing Carnage. Brad, you wrote this up for SlashFilm.com. What do we know about this? So we know there's a Venom movie in the works. Uh, it's <laughs> not 
tied into the Marvel Cinematic Universe in any capacity whatsoever. As as far as we know now, Tom Holland is not slated to appear as Spider-Man. This is supposed to be a straight-up sci-fi movie featuring Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock, who apparently comes into contact with the symbiote suit that turns him into Venom. Um, since Spider-Man's not in the movie, you have to give Venom somebody to fight, and Carnage is supposed to be the villain of the Venom movie. Uh, now, Riz Ahmed is said to was said to have originally been considered for Carnage, but apparently that was before there were some changes in the script. And after the script changes, they wanted Riz Ahmed for a different role instead. But there seems to be a lack of consensus among the trades because while some have sources are saying that he's not up for Car- Carnage anymore, he's up for a different role, other sources are saying that he's still going to end up playing Carnage. Um, and then there was another... Uh, source for one of the trade report reporters that said that there were several other actors in consideration for the same role that Riz Ahmed was up for, including um, Matt Smith from Doctor Who and Pedro Pascal from Game of Thrones and uh, Matthias uh, Shanehartz. Is that how you pronounce the name? Shanehartz? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, apparently all those three guys were in the running for the role as well, but Riz Ahmed is the one who is in talks, so we'll see how that goes and if he ends up playing carnage or a different character who is said to be a popular marvel comics character i don't know about you guys but i really have little faith in this movie i mean it it is appealing that it's going to be kind of like a sci-fi horror kind of film but um riz ahmed has been making great casting choices you know project choices thus far in his career and this just seems like a left turn for him um yeah, it seems like something that he's, you know, like maybe like a fan of the comics and just wants to be a part of this universe. I don't know if that's the case, but um, but yeah, I mean, I hope that yeah, I think in general, I'm not really looking forward to Sony's separate comic universe. So we'll see. They'll they'll have to uh, win us over on that. Brad, we might be getting more Hunger Games and Twilight movies. What do we know about this? How can we stop it? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I know that I don't care. Uh, no, 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 it's this is something that has been talked about for a while. Even You know, after the Hunger Games franchise ended, Lionsgate was still talking about how, well, you know, we think there's still plenty of stories to tell and da, 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 da. And there was talk about that even after the Twilight movies ended, that there's, you know, a, a whole world that you can play in with all the mythology of vampires and that kind of thing. And uh, Lionsgate, you know, they, they basically they come on and said that, you know, we know that there's a lot more stories to be told from these universes and we're ready to do them whenever the creators of those want to tell those stories so that sounds like it's more of just them saying uh yeah sure there might be movies sometime down the road but we don't know and whatever um it it sounds like lionsgate is missing that franchise that that you know uh ya franchise money and they're just well yeah especially since divergent crashed and burned and is now being turned into a tv series yeah uh Uh, but i don't know I will say that if there if there is going to be one of those that works out, I think the Hunger Games has a lot of potential, especially because there's a whole preceding period of time where there were other Hunger Games, or you know even the time period before the games were instated, all that all that kind of thing. So I think there there could be an interesting story there, um, but you know as we know when you know when we're given the origins of you know stories we love, they don't always really work out that well. Entertainment Weekly continues releasing news from their cover story for Star Wars The Last Jedi. Uh, Today, they've released two stories, one about Leia, one about Benicio Del Toro's character. Uh, The the story about Leia really, I mean, it's basically just working around the fact that that Carrie Fisher is dead. And how is that going to impact the Star Wars universe? Uh, Ryan Johnson admits that going into the film... You know, while he was writing the film, he even talked with uh, with um, Fisher about how Leia is this kind of tragic character that has, you know, suffered a, a ton of loss throughout the, the saga thus far. And, you know, obviously her home planet getting blown up, uh, losing um, uh, her husband, Han Solo. So there there is... Um, so maybe that's going to be dealt with in in a way. And we know that they haven't changed the film in any way since her death. But Ryan Johnson has said that even though they haven't changed the film, quote, watching the film, there's going to be a very emotional reaction 
to what she does in the movie. So take that w- what you will. Um, the interesting thing I, I, I think in this article is Ryan Jensen's talking about how the resistance kind of is still this very small, vulnerable faction in the galaxy. And that from the outstar- outset, they're kind of like uh, under attack. Do you know what I mean? Like they're not, um, you know, the First Order is still this big organization and the galaxy is is for their taking if they, if they can, you know, take it. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, I think that's interesting because I think we assumed, you know, you blowing up the Star, Sh- uh, Star Killer base, that's kind of like, you know, kind of like when we assumed Return of the Jedi. Oh, they, they pretty much won. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, right. Uh, but no, of course they have not. Uh, but the, probably the most interesting takeaway from this is that General Leia Organa is going to have a very close relationship with uh, Poe Dameron's character, the X-wing pilot, and uh, basically uh, Oscar Isaac, who plays the character, has said that basically Organa is going to almost like it, it's it's a relationship of a surrogate son surrogate mother kind of relationship it's kind of sad um and uh and she's kind of pushing him towards a leader more of a leadership role which um we'll have to see what that means for everything uh there's also some some talk about laura dern's character vice admiral hall how, how do you pronounce it haldo Haldo? I think Haldo, yeah. Yeah, uh, she's commander in the Resistance, uh, who has likely had history with Leia, but we don't know what that is. In the behind-the-scenes footage, we saw them talking, and it seemed like a uh, friendly uh, exchange, but who knows? Uh, Ryan Johnson's keeping those details close to his vest, so I'm sure there's some some twists and turns. But, um, Ben, you wrote, an, wrote up an article on SlashFilm.com about... Uh, how Benicio del Duro's character is going to figure into uh, this upcoming movie? What do we know? Yes, yeah. So his character—we don't know his character's full name yet. He has been mysteriously codenamed DJ by the filmmakers. We don't know again what that even stands for. And I think, um, I think they've said that that name might not even actually be said in the movie. Yeah, I think I think Johnson is holding that back for us to discover in the film itself. Uh, but Lucasfilm has released a, an official sort of logline description of the character, and it says that DJ is an enigmatic figure whose tattered threadbare clothes and lackadaisical attitude conceal a sharp mind and expert skills. And those expert skills turn out to be that he is a code breaker because um, John Boyega said that his character Finn and Kelly Marie trans uh, mechanic character Rose Tico uh, basically encounter DJ on the uh, in the city of Canto Bight, the casino area that we've seen a lot of so far. And uh, Boyega said that we just need a code breaker and he's the best in the galaxy. Unfortunately, he's very dodgy and only in it for the financial gain. He doesn't fight for any side. And that's one of the bigger, uh, biggest sort of reveals about uh, DJ that we've learned in this new uh onslaught of information as that is that he's basically um i read him sort of as like han solo when we first meet that character in a new hope he's he's sort of uh in it for himself he's not really a good guy or a bad guy he's just in it for whatever he can get the most money out of um uh kelly marie tran said that uh she felt like he was like a coiled tiger in the room every time she was acting with him so that was sort of an interesting thing you know he's del toro is clearly bringing his intensity uh to this movie as well um i'm wondering if uh they have to hire him because we've seen some photos or i uh, i guess in the sizzle reel there was a, a shot of Uh, Rose Tico and Finn where they're dressed undercover like in disguise as first order guards and I'm wondering if they have to hire DJ's character to help them break into Canto Bight in some way we're still not entirely sure what those um, what their mission is there Uh, but yeah that that sounds like uh, they're just gonna have to watch their backs whenever DJ is around I do like that they're bringing in more characters who are not of, you know, resistance or first order or Mm -hmm. force users, not like Sith. uh, I feel like, you know, Rebels brought in a character this past season that was kind of like this force sensitive creature that was not, you know, a Jedi or a Sith. And I like seeing 
you know, even Rogue One showed uh, some more ambivalent characters, more, you know, uh, uh, not on one side or on a weird different side. And I, I like that uh, this movie is going to be possibly doing that with Benicio Del Toro, although it seems like his motives might be, uh, I don't know, there might be something there. Yeah, the only other thing worth bringing up is that we got confirmation that hackers in the Star Wars universe are referred to as slicers, and that lines up with rumors that we heard a few months ago about Justin Thoreau's character um, playing an expert slicer. So I'm I'm not sure what his relationship is going to be like with DJ. I don't know if they're like professional rivals or if they happen to be working for like the same gang or something like that. But uh, but yeah, slicers. So that that means probably we're going to be getting a closer look at like the tech side of the Star Wars universe than we have in previous films. Guys, let's jump into the mailbag. Jordan from Massachusetts asks, quote, quote what are some f- failed movies that you believe deserve to be rebooted and given another shot? Uh, the show has been great. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, let, let's get Ben. What what are some failed movies that you think need to be rebooted? Yeah, so one of them is sort of a, a cheap, easy answer, and that's The Dark Tower, which is still in theaters right now. The movie just came out. But I think um, having seen it and not being thrilled with it, uh, and I've only read the first book in the Stephen King's seven-book series, but I've talked to a lot of people, including our own Jacob Hall, who's read all of the books and is a big fan of that whole series, um, who would love to see a reboot of The Dark Tower and just sort of uh, you know wipe the slate clean already. I don't know if that's something that's going to happen in the next few years or if Sony is going to sort of keep this franchise alive through the TV show. It, it still you know remains to be seen. But uh, I can already see the idea of a reboot of The Dark Tower um, you know, giving fans hope in the future. Uh, the other one may be a little bit more controversial because I know a lot of people love the Harry Potter films, but I am not a fan of those movies. I didn't read the books. I think it's important to point that out. So maybe that has something to do with it. But just as movies, I don't really find them to be engaging in the way that like I can see so much potential in those films, but I just don't think they're particularly well executed as a group. I mean, some of them are better than others, but um but yeah, so I, I'm like ready for a Harry Potter reboot because I know that there's a better way to do that. And I think uh, having, you know, somebody have, you know, people have bit the bullet already and created this whole cinematic franchise. I think that would be a good foundation and people can learn from the other director's mistakes and maybe sort of improve things along the way. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But uh, when a reboot does eventually happen, I will, for one, will definitely be interested in seeing the differences and and maybe if they can sort of uh, elevate the whole thing beyond what has come before. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that they're eventually going to do that. But we, we, we haven't gotten like a multi-film reboot like that yet, have we? Um, I mean, Batman. Uh, I Chris guess Nolan's Batman. Batman, but yeah. that's the only thing that instantly comes to mind. But uh it, yeah, I guess yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, the, so I guess the, the superhero books, stuff yeah. and like and like I guess you could, you know, James Bond like the but that's sort of like still an ongoing thing. So it's it's a little different there, but you know, you have like different sort of incarnations of the character, but Yeah, but even in um, even in the superhero stuff, you're telling different stories or somewhat different stories. Uh Harry Potter, I feel like you would have to stick somewhat close to the source material. So yeah, but I, yeah. I think we will eventually get that, just a matter of how long. Uh for my picks, uh, Sound of Thunder is a movie. It was a book or a short story I read. I think it was uh, written by Ray Bradbury. And it basically had to do with uh, time tourists who accidentally interfere uh, uh, too much in the past and completely alter the present. And it's basically it's basically about that butterfly effect where, like, they step, you know, they go back to the uh, Jurassic era to go you know see dinosaurs and stuff and someone steps on a bug accidentally and that causes all sorts of ripples in time and they did make a 2005 movie uh it was not good the cg is really bad even though i guess it was made for 80 million dollars that's shocking wow Uh, yeah i would recommend seeing it just to see it but it's not good uh i think a good movie could be made out of this concept and you know back to the future is my favorite movie of all time i'm a time travel geek so i'm also putting on this another time travel movie uh, movie and that's time cop 
which I think the concept there is just amazing. It could be a great uh, TV show mm. these days. Uh, the other day we had TV shows or movies that should be TV shows and Time Cop should have been on that list for me. Uh, in my th- third and final film, The Last Starfighter, which I don't think is a bad movie. Uh, it definitely doesn't hold up. Um, the, the the effects and stuff are, are not as good as I remember them when I was a kid. Uh, but the concept of a kid kind of playing this video game and being plucked out of Earth to join this intergalactic, you know, fight is something very cool. And it could make a great movie. But I guess the, the guy that made the original does not want to give up the rights. Tons of people have notoriously wanted to remake this movie, including Steven Spielberg and Seth Rogen. And if Steven Spielberg can't get the rights, then it's just not going to happen. I guess they're making a VR sequel or something like that. The the original owner of the property, Uh, Mm. Brad, what move failed movies should be rebooted and given another shot. I want to see, it doesn't necessarily need to be a reboot, but hey, just make go make another one maybe and try try it again because some people probably forgot about it. But John Carter, I love John Carter. It was a really good sci-fi adventure movie, and uh, well, the I don't movie know. was mismarketed. It shouldn't have been called John Carter. You should have kept the of Mars in the title, and they should have sold it for what it was. They were trying to hide the lead that it was a sci-fi movie, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, if anything, you know, maybe if we do it without Taylor Kitsch, maybe it'll work this time. Mm-hmm. Um. But, yeah, I would love to see a new attempt at making John Carter work because I think, yeah. you know, there's such an interesting world there to play in. And that wasn't even the biggest bomb of Taylor Kitsch that summer. Battleship was also that summer. Um, yes, uh, and, and there's other a lot of other John Carter movie, uh, stories that they could adapt. So it, it, yeah, it Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote, yeah, wrote tons of John Carter books. Yeah. Uh, what else do you have, Brad? The other one that I would like to see is Wild Wild West, because holy crap was the movie that they made back in like 1999 or whatever, just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it makes no damn sense. If you've ever uh, heard Kevin Smith talk about uh, John Peters, is that who it is? Yeah. Yeah. Producer? yeah, I guess like he had some kind of like obsession with spiders at the time and really wanted to shoehorn that into Wild Wild West, which is why... <laughs> Dr. Loveless is a giant mechanical spider. Um, I, I, and... I will put the link to that story in the show notes. So if you haven't ever heard Kevin Smith's story, it, I think it's like a 10 or 20 minute story. It's a long story. Go watch it. Believe me. Trust me. It's yeah. It's like, if, even if you do, I mean, if you don't like Kevin Smith, like that's fine. But like if there's one thing he's good at, it's like it's telling a story and making it funny and interesting. And like the way he talks about John Peters uh, and yeah, this the, the whole thing is just it's really funny. But yeah, I think that there's potential for wild wild west to become something a little bit different than what they tried to do with the original um i know that like the realm of steampunk has a really big following and i think there might be an that, opportunity that's, expo- that's exploded since wild wild west like that wasn't yeah, no, a thing back then yeah exactly and so i think now that that's all out there i think if you turn wild wild west into like a steampunk style sci-fi movie that you could turn it into something really cool I'm honestly surprised Hollywood has not tried to make a big budget steampunk franchise yet because it seems like there's an audience out there for it. I, I think maybe they think it's too niche of an audience. Yeah, that's what I think, too. From what I understand, um, the the movie that Peter Jackson's working on right now, I think it's called Mortal Engines, has some steampunk uh, inspirations and like a lot of the concept art and stuff that I've seen seems very steampunk. So maybe that would be like the first really big steampunk related things since wild wild west good point uh if you want to submit a question to the mailbag send them to peter at slash com. please mention your name general geographic location in case we mention the question on the air uh we're always looking for more questions so if you have any kind of question send it to peter at slash com. and this is where i'm going to leave brad and ben and for the feature presentation we have Huai tran Bui coming on to talk about why the 2017 summer movie season is one of the best we've seen in decades how's it going hd i'm good i'm good how are you i'm doing pretty good and the summer has been good for movies it didn't look like it was going to be that way at least in in the first month or so uh you wrote this article for slash film.com why is this summer one of the best we've seen in decades? So this summer is a wonderful 
example of uh, a shifting cinematic landscape because it's not just filled with blockbusters, but also mid-budget movies that uh, offer a lot of variety in what a theater audiences can see. Um, and they're all good movies, too. So regardless of your own personal feelings or thoughts about um, about certain movies, they all have really great audience and critical um, acclaim. So we have movies like Wonder Woman, Dunkirk, Baby Driver, um, The Big Sick, The Beguiled. Um, what else? We have Atomic Blonde. Yeah. We have just so War for many. the Planet of the Apes, which you didn't love, but War it... for the Planet of the Apes, which is a great blockbuster movie. <laughs> um, a lot of good movies, and they're not just you know divided by tentpole movies and indie films like we've seen in the past couple of uh, years and decades. Um, it was a good variety this time around, and that's why it was so exciting because uh, I wrote about this a little bit in the article, but there's been this sort of trend. Uh, of the disappearance of the mid-budget movie. And the mid-budget movie is a movie that's made between about $5 million to $60 million and can encompass anything from a romantic comedy to a high-concept thriller um, to a war movie. Uh, we saw that with Dunkirk. and Well, Dunkirk is high-budget, but Baby Driver and um, The Big Sick and Atomic Blonde are big examples of mid-budget movies that were critically acclaimed at festivals and then maintained that momentum through the mainstream releases of the films. So yeah. And they big, held and big sick was a romantic comedy for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, I think. And we haven't seen one of those, I think really do well in years. We haven't. It's really sad as a big fan of romantic comedies. I've been really upset about the disappearance of them from theaters altogether. I don't want to blame Catherine Heigl, but <laughs> I feel like she might've had a lot to do with it, or at least the movies that she was starring in. Um, she kind of, after like a couple of her movies didn't do well, like The Ugly Truth, uh, that Bounty Hunter movie with Gerard Butler. Um, wait, that was the same one. Um, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> they all kind of blend together. And, and you know, it also it seems like it, be it became all about R-rated comedies for a while. It became raunch comedies. Yeah. Um, you know, the men kind of took over the rom-com genre. Uh, and but the, but the women took it back with like Bridesmaids and stuff. But it, it seemed exactly. like it pushed out the romantic comedy, like the, you know, the the full-on romantic comedies. The, the classic one, yeah. And The Big Sick is probably the closest we've had to that traditional romantic comedy in a while. Um, but, you know, the mid-budget movie was kind of disappearing, and you're seeing directors who are, you know, pretty well-known, like Steven Soderbergh, David Lynch, turning to television because studios won't pick up their movies anymore, um, even though, because they're not solid bets, like a franchise or a superhero movie is at the box office. Well, it's interesting. And you you mentioned solid bets and going <laughs> into this summer, it, you know, we were faced with, you know, another Transformers movie, another Pirates movie, uh, you know, Baywatch reboot, you know, Guy Ritchie's King Arthur, you know, all these movies that like, like on paper for the studio seemed like good bets, Yeah, <laughs> but it weren't movies that I think people wanted to see. Uh, and it, 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 it came in the unexpected, like, it, I, I think in your article, you kind of use Wonder Woman as the, the time, the, the, the place where the tide shifted, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. So the summer movie season began with, uh, a good start with Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which was both critically acclaimed and did well at the box office. But then we had a big lull with a bunch of blockbusters that were expected to do well, like King Arthur, like Transformers, like you said. But then they did not. They flopped at the box office, except for Transformers and Pirates, I think. Uh, but yeah. we saw a lot of movies like Baywatch, for example, which seemed on paper like uh, a movie that would do well. It was a comedy with male, with popular male leads, um, but it def audiences just didn't respond to it. Um, there is a great variety article that I mentioned in my article that was talking about how studios were losing a lot of money because of their bets on franchises and male led franchises at that. I'm not going to say that like it's all men who, who <laughs> failed at the box office this time, but uh, definitely Wonder Woman movies like that and Atomic Blonde girls trip really drove the box office and just like the, the creative wave this season, the summer season. I mean, studios were blaming Rotten Tomatoes 
mm-hmm. you know, for a lot of these movies bombing. But really, it, it's bad movies and bad exactly. buzz. Uh, mm-hmm. And it seems like, you know, we've, we've had so many decades of that not mattering. Uh, you, you look at the Transformers movies, and I think Transformers 2 had, like, the worst reviews of all time and, like, the biggest box office. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if you, like, uh, relate it to how how bad the reviews were um yeah. it, it didn't matter but now it seems like you know the so not just the reviews but social media is changing you know people want to see good stuff and they want to pay for good movies yeah in this case it seems like the bad reviews and bad word of mouth actually translated to the box office which is really uh inspiring to see so i had an anecdote in my article where i talked about seeing this huge crowd coming out of a big sc- six screening and next to it was this um, theater for Transformers and there was barely anyone coming out of it. <laughs> so that was just that was a really exciting moment for me. Um, I think that audiences are getting more intelligent and getting more particular about what they want to see at the movie theaters because, you know, movies are expensive and there are so many options these days for um, good entertainment on streaming platforms. Yeah. And, and- you say genre films have never been better. You know, mm-hmm. genre films used to be the big blockbuster set. It, you didn't have to think. But now it's like, you know, I think it's the whole Chris Nolan thing. He's mm-hmm. he's pushed that genre. You know, it, it. you don't have to. Those movies don't have to talk down to an audience. Exactly. You know, they can be fun and smart at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. War of the Planet of the Apes is a really great example of that. That is a high concept intellectual blockbuster that just the both uh appeals to you know the explosions and the fun popcorn uh movies but it also you know appeals to your your emotions and your intellect and that's what's really great about genre movies these days they're finding that balance um logan did that even though that was a little bit before the summer movie season but we're seeing that with logan with uh war for the planet of the apes Dunkirk, which is kind of a genre movie, it's a war genre movie, but it, that played really interestingly with with um, just how cinema can work on the big screen. Just it was, it's an exper- experience rather than just seeing a gen- a generic war movie, like a war prestige movie, play out. For sure. So, in your analysis, you're basically saying that Hollywood, if they were looking just at the summer movie season. They should see that there is a market for these mid-budget movies and romantic comedies that film festival favorites can get an audience in the multiplex. And bad blockbusters, you know, might not attract the audiences that they used to, as well as, you know, genre films are getting better and um, women are kicking ass and uh, finally coming into their own in, in the cinema. That's basically it. Yeah, it just... I love the fact that mid-budget movies like Baby Driver and Girls Trip just pummeled The Mummy at the box office, for example. Um, and yeah, it's it's a great time for women, for mid- mid-budget movies, for genre movies that don't just appeal to your um, popcorn sensibilities. It's hopefully a shift in the cinematic landscape. I'm hoping for it anyways. Hollywood, pay attention. Yeah, you can read... HT's full article on SlashFilm.com. HT, where can we find more of your work online? So you can find me at HTranBui on Twitter, and I have a podcast, the Millennial Falcon Podcast. Thanks to Ben, HT, Brad for coming on. That does it for today's Slash Film Daily. If you like this podcast, please go over to iTunes, give us a rating, give us a review. That helps us out quite a bit. If you have any feedback, please send it to Peter at SlashFilm.com, and we will see you tomorrow.